Did anybody come expecting today? Man, I, I am. I got to be real honest with you. I, I've had my uh, moments, I always do. I've had my season of just uh, almost being, uh, you know, taking care of dad just somehow sucked some of the life out of me and vision and all that and then my own health issues. But uh, I want to just say, a, give a testimony to Jesus today that uh, I'm looking forward and I'm cranked and uh, I want to finish strong. I want to finish real strong in life. I've had an awesome life, and I look back how many times God spoke to me supernaturally, and they came to pass. There's been a lot of times I thought I heard him, and it didn't work, okay? <laughs> so if you have some of those, you just got to go past it. It's just a learning curve. It's, you know, everybody falls down when they're learning to walk. Uh, let's jump, jump into some scriptures here, and I won't keep you all day, but let's, uh, let's turn to Second Timothy Number um, Second Timothy three one through seven. Okay, I had this all set up. I have to look it up because it came off my phone. Second Timothy, what did I say, is that three? One through seven, okay, here we go. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Did difficult times come in? From the time of Christ till now, there's been difficult times, and they're all part of the last days. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of that going on right now, isn't there? I mean, it always has been, but right now we've got some uh, social media that allows people just to be extremely brutal and haters of good and uh, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, uh, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these, for among them as uh, those... Uh, for among them are those who enter into households and, and captivate weak women, weighed down with uh, sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. And that's just what Jenna said, too. Always learning but never coming to the action of, uh, of, of acting on it. You know, one of the things I want to just bring out there is that... Uh, in the list of all these horrible things of being un disrespectful, ungrateful, and all that, in the midst of that, he comes up with holding to a form of godliness, though, although they have denied its power. To me, that's one of those things that it says, avoid, such, avoid those kind of people. Okay, to avoid somebody that's just into malicious gossip and somebody that's just a hater, that's pretty easy for me. But to discern those who are holding on just to a form of godliness, an outward showing of goodness, you might say, but having no power, avoid those people. Now, I, I'm not, you, you got to decide who you think that is. But for me, I've met a lot of people that have a real godliness, a real... Uh, they have a form of being religious, of being you know, of uh, piety towards those things. They 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 have the outward showing that they, you know, like going to church and like being, you know, but they have no power. And the Bible literally says it's ball, it's saying avoid those people. Why? Because he'll slip in and he'll sneak into your life. Um. Hebrews 2, let's go there, 14 through 16. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, and he himself likewise also partook, 
partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through death, fear of death, were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly he does not give help to the angels, but gives help to the descendants of Abraham. We've been talking about how God took Abraham out and said, look into the stars, that's going to be your descendants that are like that. It wasn't talking about the Jewish people, it was talking about those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we know that there's billions of stars and are, there probably are billions of Christians, but we, I think there's going to be a lot more. Uh, and he's saying, I'm going to help them from, to do what? To be free from the fear of death. To be free from the fear of death. All their lives, it said, you know. So what we want to avoid and what we want to step out of is we want to, we want to remember that uh, we're not here just to look good. We're not here just to go through some, uh, you know, nice moments together. We're here to be children of God who have no longer governed by fear. Because if we're governed by fear, then we become slaves all of our life. And one thing, I, 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 I love that song, I'm no longer a slave to sin. And it's not just talking about I'm no longer a slave to drinking and carousing and all that. It's far more than that. That's, that's almost like shallow stuff It's to me. It's like sin is missing the mark. There is a mark for you. There is, you are created holy. You are created with a, with a specific things placed inside of you. Your life is so significant. It, it is not a, you're not just one in a crowd. You stand out as an individual. Though God loves billions of people, every one of them stands out as a very unique person very much created in His image, and very holy like Him. There's nobody like you. And so there's, there's your jobs in life, and what you need, to, what, what God has for you to do, and what God has you to be is, is uh, extraordinary, not ordinary. Hallelujah. And by fear, we can actually become slaves, and not slaves to sin, which is missing the mark. Again, yeah, we don't want to be doing all the things that are evil, etc. But it's more than that. It's missing what you were called to do. Missing who you are called to be. And one thing we are called to be, uh, well, let's just go on. Let's go to uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 2. We'll start with verse 16. Therefore, let no one act as your judge in regard to food, drink, or respect to the festival or of, of the new moon or the Sabbath day. May I just say... That uh, I've never wanted to join a group that just start, starts telling me what I could do and what I couldn't do in everything and, and just got opinions about everything. You know, it's like, let's just read on. Verse 17, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. There are so many people just keeping outward things of rituals, of communion, and, and baptism, and, and all those things are good things, and, and, uh, etc. But a lot of times, they're just shadows of things to come, and they aren't the real substance of Christ. And it says, you know, that uh, don't let anybody be your judge on that. I mean, you look how many rules some organizations have. You can wear this, you can't wear that, you, can, you know, you can't have jewelry, you can't have this, you can't... And he just says, don't get caught up in that. Verse 18, let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with a growth which is from God. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you are living in the world, do you su submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, and do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men? These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in, so uh, in self-made religion and self-abasement, severe treatment of the body, but of no value against fleshly indulgence indulgences 
Man, that says an awful lot right there. But there are so many that want to control you, want to control people, and they get them into their organizations or their churches, and they start giving them all the rules, and they, and they start uh, controlling it, all that stuff. And the whole thing is, it's a form of godliness, and there's no power in it. But Paul is saying here, man, you get connected to the head of the body, and you stay with that, and you stay with that that has substance. And, and follow him. And, and uh, so that's one of the reasons we constantly uh, need to understand that there are very few that walk in this. There are very few that walk in this. That's why you sometimes see some major leaders that have had a huge impact on people all of a sudden walking off in adultery and say, what happened to them? They fell. No, the whole concept of, of Christianity was wrong. They thought they were to build some gigantic ministry and be somebody, somebody's hero or whatever else. And the whole thing was wrong. They weren't helping people get connected to Jesus. They were, they were trying to make a form of godliness and, and, and brag on their people and what they do and what they didn't do or whatever else. But they didn't really get to know who Christ really was in their daily walk. And then we go to uh, 2 Timothy 1.7 that we were at last week. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity or fear but a power, love, and discipline. We, we've been, we have the opportunity. Listen, you know, you can say, well, we all fear. But listen, we need, we need to avoid the form of godliness that has no power in it. This, this walk is a walk of constant deciding and constantly committing, you know, and making a commitment. We were playing volleyball the other day, and it's like, you know, Luke was saying, man, you got to be committed, you know, and that was part of it is when you fly through the, through the air and put your hand down so the ball can hit it, and you, you leave skin on the floor and everything else, but you got to be, you can't do that unless you're committed. And you and I have to make decisions all the time of how committed we are going to be to what we really believe. And if we aren't really committed to that, we're going to get sucked into a bunch of do's and don'ts and don't handle this. And I remember growing up as a kid, I wanted to grow my hair out. I'm not really sure why. I really don't know why. I guess because I still had hair. And, uh, I, you know, and so I want, but it was a major controversy in my home. And in my church, it was like, you know, and, and, and looking back, even now, it just disgusts me. I'm sorry, you know, uh, I've, I've, I've had good friends that'll preach down, you know, guys having earrings, and it's just nothing but cultural preferences. It really isn't. Majoring on little things like that, making a big issue and calling it holiness and calling it all kinds of things. And listen, it really is nothing, Hallelujah. Don't get caught up in the do's and the don'ts. Make, get to the substance. And part of the substance is we are children of God. And as children of God, we have not been given a spirit of fear. Do not allow fear to have a justification in your life that everybody else has it too. So what? So what if everybody else has got fear? We are a, genera- we are a group of people that have come to know Christ and we have not been given that spirit of fear from Him. So if it's not from Him, we don't have to accept it. And we actually should not only not accept it, we should drive it away. How do we drive it away? He says it right here. By receiving the spirit of power and of love and of discipline or a sound mind or self-control. Hallelujah. Man, it, it, we... We've been given what it takes to be strong. We've been given what it takes to be bold. We've been given what it takes to be courageous. And a little, uh, I just want Jenna to come up because, you know, that, that little girl, she, she just almost, I mean, if God didn't take care of her, she'd be dead. And you can say, I, you know, I mean, she, she did such, forgive me, Jenna, she did such foolish things. She gets to Africa and is trying to get out of the country, and uh, the board it hasn't got ready. I don't know how the whole thing was on the border thing, but she jumped in the back of some old uh, some old truck with another gal to get through the border, you know, with a bunch of guys. You know, I'm sorry, but if you're white and beautiful like Jenna, you don't jump in the back of a truck in Africa and headed through the bush. I mean, you know, it's just like, but she's so foolish that she actually believed God would take care of her, and look what happened. He did. Hallelujah. We've not been given a spirit of fear, but of love and power and of a sound mind. Glory to God. It's sin to miss that mark. It's sin to miss that mark of what He's given to us. Hallelujah. 
You know, I've been sharing with uh, that everybody's part is critical. Everybody's part is critical is what the Lord told me. And said, uh, right in my hot tub, he spoke to me. He says, tell everybody, tell them in every country, tell your church members, tell everybody. He said, tell them that their part is critical. You know, I, I, I said, okay, how do I do that? He said, I'll show you how. And so I've been thinking about that. I've been doing that, preaching in Singapore, preaching in Myanmar, preaching here. But I tell you, even now as I think about it, man, he was talking to me, not to all of you. He's talking to me. You know, some, I didn't believe everybody's part was critical. I didn't believe it. Some parts don't seem that important. They, they don't seem like they're doing all that much. And, and, you know, so you think, okay, this is the honorable thing is to respect everybody and tell every little kid that can't play soccer that they still get an award. You know, I, I, you know you're, you, you still, your part's still important even though you never even touch the ball and you're picking up grass the whole time you're playing. And that's kind of the mentality some of us have, or I know, I, you know I've had. But as, as the last few years after he's told me that, I, I go back to it and I go, boy, you were, you were serious. You're serious. Yes, I am, he said. Every part's critical. We get to see sometimes the tip of the spear and you know, you know, all that, but we, a lot of times we have no idea what goes on in the background. You know, one thing, May, May has touched a lot of people, you know, on health. She's, got, she's helped so many people. But what we didn't see is how much her husband did in the background and how she's, got, she's saying, I don't know how I'm going to do this now alone. We so often don't recognize the little key. You know, and I don't know about you, but you know, sometimes we get pumped up to be the big show, you know, be the big hero and everything else. But you know, I'm, I'm realizing this. Listen, Lord, my, my quest in life is not to be what somebody else thinks I need to be to be successful. My quest in life is to do what you asked me to do to be successful. And maybe nobody will even know I'm even doing it. And that's all right with me. That's why I don't worry about some legacy. I, I don't think that's a wrong thing per se, but it's like, who? What do I care when I die? What do I care how many people come to my funeral and what they put on my tombstone and what they said I did and what they put in the paper? What do I care? Because once I die, I'm in a new place. I don't care. I'm not coming back to get some pat on the back. I'm going to the one who's really going to reward me. Hallelujah. And so I want to live my life focused on that, uh, uh, on... Uh, be obedient. And one of the things he wants me to do, he says, man, I've not given you a spirit of fear, so deal with it. I've not given you a, a spirit of weakness, so get a hold of what I'm giving to you. I'm going to give you power. I'm going to give you wisdom. Listen, I'm looking at a lot of people aging right now, and they are being conformed to the world. They're being told you're getting older. They're being told you're going to lose your mind. They're being told, well, that's just the way it happens. And I'm thinking, man, God didn't say that. He didn't say, I'm going to give you a spirit of weakness after you turn 60. He said, I've given you a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind, but you got to believe it. It won't work if you don't believe it. And you got to fight. you got to say, well, I don't want to be crazy. All right, then you made your decision. He'll honor that, and so will everybody else. Everybody's part's important, and everybody has to believe that their part is important. And so many times I think, you know, there's some things that I do that everybody sees and says, well, John, that was great and awesome. But I, I tell you that some of the things that, that I got to do that nobody will ever know about, but maybe one or two people. I've walked out of the hospital once when I got to go walk up to a gal. I hardly knew this gal. She was a Mexican. She says, will you come and minister to my mom? She's in the hospital. I said, yes, I will. I went in there. And I sat down, and I just talked to this gal, and she just opened up her life. And for about an hour, she just starts saying, th saying, this is what happened to me. When I was 30, this, my husband left me, and da-da-da-da, and this is what happened. I fell into sin. I did this, and I did that. You know, and, and uh, you know, it was a great story about God bringing her back home and reconciling. But, you know, as we were walking out, this, the, gal, the daughter was walking with me, and she just started weeping. I said, what's up? I said, what's up? She said, I would have never known any of that if you hadn't showed up. I've asked my mom over and over, what happened? What happened? She said, I knew enough, there was enough evidence. I knew that she'd been married. I didn't know who to. And she said, and anyway, and she just wept and cried. She said, I would never know. And I walked out of there and I looked up to the Lord and I said, you know, this is the thing that sometimes this is the, some of the most awesome things I get to do that nobody will get to know. 
I've never met him before. I've never met him afterwards. But I believe I was there at a critical time to touch people's lives for all eternity. And what I'm trying to say by that is you and I need to recognize that he does not see what we see. And he does not think like we think, but we can start seeing what he sees and we can start thinking like he thinks. And some of the smallest things are some of the most important things you're ever going to do in your life. Think big, but do small things. Do not underestimate the value of you just walking with God and hearing the little things that he wants you to do. Yeah, he'll maybe sometimes tell you some business deal, they'll, they'll make you multimillionaires, and, and that's great. But he's also going to tell you some things just to turn one person's life, just to be there at the right moment to say the right thing, to pray the right thing. And, and in the light of eternity, you're going to say, that's way bigger than those millions. That's way bigger than this. But listen... You and I, nobody else is going to encourage you but God. Nobody else is going to encourage you but the truth of some brother or sister to tell you that you're, what you have inside of you is absolutely critical for the success of the kingdom of God. And if you don't fulfill your part, there will be many who will lack. Most will tell you that you're going to have to be somebody great or somebody awesome, but I'm telling you, I think it's the smallest things that we get to do. And here's the deal. He'll do great things, but if you and I don't believe that our everyday life counts, we're not going to have the faith, we're not going to have the energy, we're not going to have the right spirit to make those moments count. If we're only looking for the big things in life and the way we end, then we're not going to hit the mark where we need to be hitting the mark. We need to see what God sees, that this thing is eternal, this thing is big, and it happens at a very minute level. Some of the most smallest things that we get to do are what changes everything. In uh, 1 Thessalonians, we were there before. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really was uh, and is the word of God, which also performs its work in you, who believe. Man, I just, I just want to just, I'm excited. I realize that. I'm pumped. I'm thinking. I like God when I'm pumped. Thank you. I, you know, people say, you get so wound up. And, and a lot of people, I think, like it. Some people don't. Some people don't want to come because, you, know, you just, I had one brother just said, you just get way too emotional for me. And I said, that's okay. The, and, you know, the only thing was, I asked him to come up and share the next week, you know, just to share his testimony. He got so emotional. He said, I'll never criticize you again. He said, you get up there, you get something happens to you. But I'm just telling you, man, is not life worthy of getting excited about? Is not being in existence in the, in the form of God worth getting excited about? Do we all have to be conformed to this world's down-in-the-dumps attitude, barely getting by, moaning and groaning about this, griping and complaining about the long lines of the traffic or whatever else? Do we all have to do that? Or can some of us just go ahead and step out of that whole thing and be different? And be holy from the standpoint of not common. And just say, I'm excited about my life. God has given me an ability to live. And he's given me the ability to, to grow and, and to believe. And, and, and it, doesn't have to be, it, it doesn't have to impress anybody. It, it, hasn't, it doesn't have to impress any, anybody what your bank account is. Or, or your educational level is. Or whatever else. It just has to be, are you living what God's put inside of you? He's put inside you life that's going to be living for eternity. Are you living in that? Or, or, or are you being squeezed out of life because of your own mistakes? You know, I think about how many people have divorced. And in many churches, it's like, once you divorce, well, you just went down to a lower class. You can never have what you could have had because you went through that. You can never have it because you went to, you know, because you got... You went to jail, you went to this, you did this or whatever else. And God is the one that says, man, when I see my son coming back, I run and put a robe on him, a ring on him, and we start partying. Because he was lost and now found, and it's a new, whole new day. It's a brand new day, hallelujah. For this reason, he said, we thank God that you accepted the things that you heard as really coming from God and not just from people. This is so important. It's so important. Let's go to Genesis, the fifth chapter, verse 22. It says, Then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah. And he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. That's a long time to be hanging around, isn't it? 
365 years. Verse 24. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. I don't know what great things Enoch did. I don't know how many cattle he had and how many sheep. It really doesn't make much difference, does it? But somehow Enoch walked with God. You know, in some ways, I think some people think if you're going to walk with God, you've got to have some super ministry, you're going to have to have some super do whatever. But I, think, I say the superness is just the natural life walking with him. You know, the Lord has spoke some things in my life that come to pass, but some of the sweetest things are just the daily conversations I have with him when he speaks to me. Just little things he says. Don't take that parking spot. Take this one right now. It allows me to bump into somebody that I needed to talk to. Those are huge to me. Those get me excited. Of all the things you and I can believe for, I think one of the greatest things we can believe for is just saying, God, I want to walk with you. I remember when I first got into the uh, charismatic movement or whatever you want to say, I didn't get into that. I just got into the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit filled me. And, and uh, I actually never did get into the movements. So I kind of was repulsed by it. But I remember being with Assembly Gods in Newell. We went over there for a while uh, in that church and worked there. And I remember some of the older folks were t- uh, would just get elated. They're up in their years, but they would just see if you got to talk to them, they'd say, back in 1944, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. I spoke in tongues. Man, it was the greatest thing. And I remember thinking then, man, that's really sweet. But what has happened since then? You come alive when you talk about something, a moment back then. You talk about a miracle that happened back then, a great healing back then, or a great t- deliverance. But what has happened in between? And I remember thinking to myself at that time, I said, I don't want to live from one big miracle to the next. I want to live every day walking with God. I want to hear his voice every day. I want to, I'm going to thank God for the big ones, but I'm going to really enjoy the fellowship. You know, that's almost like getting married and getting to see each other once a year. No, not me. No, honey, you're going you're gonna to marry me. We're going to live together. We're going to be together. It hasn't turned out as good as I thought. Uh, so often we got, we're driving two cars because we're always going so many different ways. Uh, but I'm telling you, you and I can walk with God. But to do it, we got to get the right spirit of power and of love and self-control. Most of us brag on how we don't have any self-control. I do it all the time. You know, I won't get into that. But just present cookies to me and just watch me melt. I want to get focused in on the greatest thing I can do, and that's walk with God in my own personal everyday life, not just for the ministry, not just for some sermon, but just walk with God. To do that, I'm going to have to make a decision to cut everything else off. I want to encourage you to decide you're going to walk with God. Because if you don't, you may just walk near him once in a while. My desire for you is not that, you, uh, is not that this group would just grow and look good for the whole world to see and see ball BF is doing good or whatever. My desire is for each one of you to walk in power, to walk in love, and to walk in self-control and a sound mind. Walk with God. Fight the good fight. You know, in some ways, when I get done with a sermon like this, I think, oh, wow, got wound up again. Ah, oh, you know. But then I think, who else is telling you this? Where else can you go? Nobody but true believers encourage people to believe in God. There's a lot of people encourage you, there's a lot of people out there encouraging people to be religious. Adhere to the form. Dress right. Act right. Don't say those bad words. Don't do this. Do this. There's, you know, but only somebody who knows God and walks with him is going to really have the ability to encourage you to say, forfeit it all. 
lose it all to have this walk with him. I heard a preacher the other day said that he's reading out of that, I think Colossians there. So if you've died with Christ, it's no longer, you, you know, several scriptures there, Galatians. And if you've died with Christ, he said, a lot of people have only just fainted with Christ. They kind of dropped down for a little bit, then they got back up. But when you've died to Christ, it's no longer you live. It's all of a sudden now you're a brand new creature that has the ability to live a life without fear. I don't want to teach on fear because then you just got your mind on fear. But the opposite of fear is power, love, and a sound mind. Would you stand with me, please? You know, I appreciate what Jenna shared this day so much is the fact of I had a, I had a good friend that I mean he read a book a day and uh, and uh, I finally I read one of his bu- books you know and I was pretty excited to come back and fellowship with you know and I said man I read this book he said yeah I've read that and I said what'd you do about it well, I said well nothing I just I I just read them. And at first, I was kind of intimidated that he reads so much, you know, that he, man, you're so much smarter than I am. You read so much. And then it was almost like I looked at him and I go, that's something to be avoided. It's something to really be avoided to keep hearing something, reading something, listening to something over and over and over and over. Good, you know, and we, we, I don't know if we, jo- we don't joke about it. It's the truth is there's a lot of people show up once a month, once every six months and they say, and they apologize. Well, I'm sorry I couldn't be there. It's like, why are you apologizing? I'm telling you, if you came here and you heard the word of God and you didn't show up for a whole year, but you acted on it, you'd be far, far, the farther ahead than everybody that just keeps listening. It doesn't, it doesn't act on it. It doesn't make it theirs. Hallelujah. You know, and sometimes I, I, I sometimes think, you know, my, I get more fired up when I think, you know, maybe funerals do something to me because I think, what if I died? You guys would go to the last things I said. So I always think, I may never, I may never preach again. That's, a, that's when I preach my best. Because I think, man, get a hold of this. Okay, now, honestly, it's a struggle for me, and I know it's a struggle for you to walk out of here and stay thinking, yes, I'm going to stay on, I'm going to stay on, I'm going to, I'm going to stay radical in my faith. It's so easy to just go out there and start lulling back into, in it? You don't want to look too excited because then your wife's getting mad because you're all excited about that, but you've been such a bad person all week. Amen? Been down the dumps, and now you're going to be all excited because Pastor John preached a word. I'm telling you, man, humble yourself and get excited. Humble yourself and say, God, I'm hanging on to this word. I'm no longer, uh, uh, you know, a slave to sin. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm believing for the best. Wherever I'm at, I'm going to make things different. And, and, and I'm going to be, Father, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Can you lift your hands with me just for a moment here and just worship him? Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you. You're a God that is a good, good father. And God, you are God. You are God. You are supernatural. You are are not like a man. You are are all powerful and you are incredible and you're amazing. and, And you're not down in the dumps and you're not depressed. And we came from you. We're your children. Father, I'm asking today... Whatever day this is, I think it's October 29th, 2017. Didn't think we'd get this far. But I'm asking for miracles to take place today that we, each one of us walks out of here, grabs hold of some word that you've spoken to our hearts individually. And we don't let go of it. And we fight the good fight of faith. And it is a fight because everything in the natural wants to pull us back down to mediocrity. And Father, I think a lot of us right now are just so afraid of failure. We're so afraid if we step out and say something bold and it doesn't come to pass that we're going to look like fools. But really, what do we got to lose? And what do we got to win? If 
Father, I don't know if I'll ever preach to anybody else again, but if, if somebody, just somebody hears this today and says, oh, that's, that's a God inside of me. I feel Him talking to me. And my life counts. And my faith counts. And I want to cut off everything else. And I definitely want to cut out the fear that's been enslaving me. Enslaving me. This fear has got me. It's gripped me by like a, a ring in a bull's nose. And it's leading me wherever it wills. And Father, I want deliverance today. I want deliverance today. To be your child and be without fear. Thank you, God, for miracles right now in this room. And we give you all the praise. We give you all the praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We'll give God some thanks. Just whisper and thank Him. Let the Holy Spirit just give you something to take home today to walk on, to step on, and, and to shout out. This truth sets you free. Amen? All right, have a great week.